verses of Scripture, one from Ezekiel 36, 26, and then from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. First, from Ezekiel. Amen. And tune in this morning. This is, this is something, this is not the last time you'll ever hear this message. This is the first time I've ever preached it in my life as a United Methodist minister. And by the grace of God, I believe it's something that God gave me. Let's tune into these scriptures. A new heart I will give you, and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove from your body the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Little word I would add to that. God is not through with us yet. Amen? Amen. 17, 517. So if anyone's in, if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old is passed away. See, everything has become new. I'm going to make an assumption this morning. And the assumption is this that all of us are works in progress. That God is not through with us yet. That we're works in progress. And that while we're on the face of this earth, there's hope. And while we're on the face of this earth, God is, God is at work in each of our lives. The title of this morning's message is Be a Transformer. God calls us to be transformers. I go to this thing called the Board of Ordained Ministry. And they have these things called retreats. And on these retreats, they're really, it's an experience for where, um, in my annual conference report next week, I'm going to tell you about people being commissioned and people being ordained. And you go for several days and you're examined by committees. The bishop himself appoints the clergy on the Board of Ordained Ministry. I'm entering my third term, and then I can't be on anymore, but the bishop will have nominated me, this will be the third time, to be on the Board of Ordained Ministry, and you examine the candidates who are coming forward to assess their fitness to be ordained in the United Methodist Church. Now, especially if you're being examined, this is somewhat anxiety, Provoke. The night before I was to go before my examination, I was sick. And the line in the sand, I said to God, as long as my fever's below 104, I'm going to go. If it goes above 104, I won't go. And by the grace of God, I was able to go. And I was ordained. First in 1992 and then in 1994. But... They're trying to make this kinder and gentler, so we have devotions. A brother or pastor of mine, Reverend, don't put it up yet, Reverend Jeff Marquet, he serves the Chatham United Methodist Church, and it really is North Jersey. It's really North Jersey. And he said one day he just felt God move his spirit. So he went to the local power plant. You know, like when you drive by and they have the the fences with the barbed wire and nobody's allowed in. He went in and he said, guys, I want to get a transformer. He said, I want to use one of your transformers. He said, why do you want a transformer? He said, well, I want to use it in my church. I want to put a transformer right in the center aisle. And I want to explain to my people what a transformer is. And transformers are used to increase or decrease voltage. Mostly to decrease. Because you see those high tension lines? There's thousands and thousands of volts. And if those thousands of volts went into your house, it wouldn't be good for your toaster. <laughs> it wouldn't be good for the microwave. It wouldn't be good for the washing machine. You see these transformers on the telephone pole. Rich, would you show us a picture of a transformer? I can't have it in the aisle. But show us a, a nice picture. So it'll come up sooner or later. There you go. You got it? Okay. That's a picture of a transformer. I, I was saying to God, maybe I should preach on this message this week, God. And then the, 
I felt like I should look up, and I looked out my window, and there is an exact transformer like that right outside my office window. And what a transformer does is it takes something that would hurt us, and it transforms it into something that could help us. So Jeff, I gotta tell you a little bit of Jeff's story. So he goes to the power plant, you know, can I have a transformer, please? Why do you want a trick? I want to use it as a prop for a message in my church. He said, well, then where can I buy one? And this is where hope came in. Mississippi. So he said, I'll call Mississippi. So he called Mississippi and he said, well, you know, good chance to be a Christian in Mississippi. You know, he's hoping maybe for a Southern Baptist. So a guy answers the phone. He says, I would like to buy a transfer. Who are you? I'm a preacher in New Jersey. Why do you want a transformer? To use it as a prop that God transforms, that God transforms things to us and makes it into a blessing. He has a real live transformer in his office. They didn't put all the toxic stuff on the inside of it. But then I said to him, Jeff, could I borrow that? He said, no way, that's my transformer. <laughs> He, he won't let me borrow it. So we'll have to go with the picture. That's a transformer. It's a transformer on a pole. And just This is a definition. Transformers take something that would hurt us and transformers turn something that would hurt us into something that would bless us. Got me to thinking. Does anybody know of a transformer that hung on a pole? Let's show the other picture. There's a transformer on a pole right there. And the problem was sin. And this transformer, first of all, says, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And the last thing this transformer says, he says, pay in full. Your sin and my sin. Man, we got to transform the par excellence. But here's the challenge. He calls us to be transformers. So I'm going to have to go to a traditional problem good news response message this morning. The problem is this. Well, let me tell you a story. East Brunswick, New Jersey, 46 Hillsdale Road, quarter acre. One time a girl in my church group said to me, I have a confession of it's the poor side of East Brunswick. A girl in my church group said to me, all the houses in your neighborhood look the same. Yeah? What's your point? I like neighborhoods where the houses look different, where they have different models. There are neighborhoods like that? <laughs> I just thought our quarter acre of paradise was what everybody else had. Well, one night on this quarter acre of para paradise, on a hot, humid night, all of a sudden there was this loud crashing noise and a blue flash. One of the transformers blew on the pole and the power went out. And all of us neighbors decided to be really good neighbors that night. Y'all pour out of your house. In Jersey Central Power and Light, you know, the man comes out with the spotlight in the pickup truck. You know, oh, it's that one right there. Yeah, yeah, I see it. And the lineman came out. We became friends with the lineman. I remember somebody asking him, like, we're just talking there, you know. Have you ever been shocked? We asked the lineman. He said, yeah, I've been shocked. He said, how bad? He said, I'm still here. <laughs> Well, you know something? Maybe this morning we're, we've got some bloom transformers here in God's church. But I got good news. Look to your neighbor and say, I'm still here. I'm still here. Hey man, go ahead and say that to your neighbor. I'm still here. What causes transformers to blow up in the church? Well, we could spend years on this. Not being new in Jesus Christ is the chief answer. 
Three enemies of your being transformed and not being new in Christ. Self-confidence. The problem is not with confidence. The problem is with self. The problem is not with confidence. The problem is the word self-confidence. First piece of wisdom we need is can you believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us? Second problem with being a transformer is a lack of prayer. And the third problem is disobedience. Just doing your own thing. Hey, help us, Jesus. By the way, this is the story of Jericho, after Jericho. God gives the Israelites a big victory in Jericho, and then they've got this little battle to fight called Ai. And they lose. They get killed. They get creamed. Why did they lose? Self-confidence, they didn't seek the Lord. Lack of prayer, they didn't go for the Lord. And they had an issue of disobedience in their camp. Hey, enough of the problem. We deal with blown transformers every day in the life of the church. We're all blown transformers in one way, shape, or another. The good news we can be new in Jesus Christ. Because I'm in Christ, I'm a new creation. The old is gone, the fresh and new is come. Ezekiel 36, 26. God gives us a new heart. What does it look like to be new? Are there some handles out there? What would it look like to be a, like a real life transformer? Let's look to God's word. Abraham. He believed God and it was credited to him without righteousness. Shiloh Baptist Church, Trent, New Jersey. I was assigned to go to an African American church. The message this morning was on Abraham. The message was going without knowing. Amen. He believed God. God said it. I believe it. That settles it. That's faith. Amen. I'm new in Jesus Christ. The old is gone. The fresh and new has come. Abraham's an example. You know, another example is Judah. Judah. And you know what happens to Judah? He makes some stupid decisions in his life. And he doesn't want to be that way anymore. He's a gossiper and God turns him into a grace giver. What does he do? He throws his brother Joseph into a pit. What happens to Judah? Years later, in front of Joseph, Joseph says, I'm going to lock up your little brother Benjamin. Judah says, lock me up first. It'll kill the old man if he loses another son. It'll kill my father. Lock me up first. Judah is changed. Years ago, we had a Bible study called An Ordinary Day with Jesus. And one of the preachers, they went before the Lord and said, I don't want to be like this anymore. Fill in the blank. Sometimes we become a transformer. You know, this can happen ten times in the day. Lord, I don't want to be like this anymore. And God will help you. Like he helped Judah. Stephen. He's the transformer. They're stoning him to death. You know what Stephen does? He says, Lord, don't hold this sin. And there's this guy named Saul who doesn't, you know, while they're killing Stephen, doesn't want to make sure he wants to watch their coats. He's doing coat check. You know, when you're killing somebody, you certainly don't want to have your coat stolen from you. And Saul, the enemy of the church, becomes its biggest advocate in the New Testament. And then... Saul becomes Paul, and Paul's a transformer. He and Silas, they get beaten by a crowd and beaten by the Romans. And they're transformers, though, because they're singing praise. They're singing praise. And God sends an earthquake. And again, wherever he goes, he's going to be a stone catcher. He's going to be a blessing. Good news. The Bible tells us we can be new in Jesus Christ. We can be transformers like our Lord and Savior. Response.
To be a transformer, you got to be transformed. Amen. And the Bible says, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Have you ever asked to be transformed? By the way, you have if you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. But you need to read a little bit more of the fine print. You have asked to be transformed if you've asked Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior. Like Abraham, believe God. Your sins are forgiven. Like Judah, you can change. God can change Judah. And you know, from this guy Judah, we get our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He was a son of Leah as well. That's a whole other sermon. Like Stephen, we can be a stone catcher. Joseph put it this way, As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to save many people alive. Amen. A line jumped out at me. This will be in my annual conference report next week. Love makes us inventors. Love makes us inventors. And you know, this morning, this isn't in my notes, but it hit me really hard. I have an example of that in the Cinnamons in School System. Mrs. Smith, she was a kindergarten teacher. And she had a son who just wasn't getting it. He wasn't thriving in this class of 25 kids. But she loved her son, and she was a teacher. She invented something called developmental K. And I want to tell you, that blessed my family. And Mrs. Smith was one heck of a lady. At the end of the conference, and she would say to me, when, say a prayer, not too loud. We're in a public school. <laughs> But say a prayer with me. And we pray. She's retired now, so they can't get her. <laughs> <laughs> but love makes us inventors. You know, I'm in this terrible, lousy situation, and I don't know what to do. The love of Jesus Christ can be a true north. It can really help you. God will make a way when there seems to be no way. I close this morning. Stay with me. It's not a real quick closing, but we're, there, we're getting there. <laughs> Gwen and I went to the seminary weekend at the Eastern Baptist Theological Seminary. Very proud that my son was going to Princeton. I was accepted there to the seminary, which is different from the undergrad school. I know that. Different standards of letting people in. I know that. They gave me a full scholarship, but I went to the main line instead in Philadelphia. I'll tell you why sometime. We went to an Exploring Christian Ministries conference, Gwen and I, and in 1985, or no, it was 1987. It was a spring night. I think the weather was a little cool that night. And I listened to the message, and I still remember the guy, the preacher's name was Robin Roberts. And he said, here's the key to following Jesus Christ. I still remember the message. Not my will, but thy will be done. And what I'm about to tell you, whether you're the Pope or a pauper, whether you're a general or a clerk in Walmart, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, whether you like to listen to Rush Limbaugh, or MSNBC, or Fox, this teaching will apply to you. Whether it's a tempest in a teapot or a hurricane. When we're in tight spots, there's willfulness or there's willingness. Willfulness is God, I want to do this my way. My way. 
I don't like it right now, and I want it my way. That's willfulness. Jesus Christ even dealt with this. Do I really have to do this cross thing? Is there another way, God? What are the other options? And then Jesus said, not my will, but thy will be done. And that's called willingness. We all deal with this. Nobody's excluded from this. And by the way, willfulness, it gets our attention sometimes. It's a good thing. Gets our attention. When I'm angry about something, well, you got my attention now. There's a lot of energy in it too. But willfulness can be converted into willingness. And willingness is not my will, but thy will be done. God's way. And sometimes we go through hell to get there. From willfulness to willingness. But if Jesus Christ is with us, it is worth the journey. It is worth the journey. Help us, Jesus. And the question for each of our lives is, will we face God's light? Will we face God's plan with willfulness or with willingness? And I have one prayer for that. Help us, Jesus. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Lord, help us, Jesus. Help us. And we bow before you. And Lord, Lord, Job teaches us. And Job's friends teach us that we can't solve this for anybody else. But each of us, we have a journey of faith. Help us, Lord, to be transformers. And to be transformers, each of us, we need to be transformed. So next time, in the tight spot, help us to be willing. Not my will, but thy will be done. We ask this. And Lord, may everybody enact that trans transaction this morning the way it needs to be transacted. Our eyes are closed, our heads are bowed. Maybe it's lifting a hand this morning to say to you, God, you need to do me this morning, Lord. You need to do me in a new way. However that is. Maybe it's later this afternoon, but Lord, I'm kind of nervous about that because anything put off those things need to be done sooner rather than later. So Lord Jesus help us to be willing in the kingdom of God. We pray this in your name Jesus and all God's people said Amen. Amen.